Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm John Hodge, joined by J.C. Abbott. Today, we're discussing disappointing losses from the Red Blacks and Stampeders that have made their road to the postseason much less likely. Dad Kelly drawing comparisons to the great Doug Flewey. The Rough Riders welcoming Corey Sheets back to Regina. Taylor Algurzma having a career day for Wilfrid Laurier University. And the passing of a well-known CFL and NFL agent. But first. The Blue Bombers handed the Rough Riders the most lopsided loss of the 2023 season so far in the Banjo Bowl. Demolishing their Prairie foes by a score of 51 to 6. Winnipeg scored touchdowns on each of their first six possessions as Zach Kolaris threw for 319 yards and five touchdowns before sitting out the entire fourth quarter. Do you think the Bombers deserve credit for their dominance or should the Riders be buried for rolling over? I mean, I don't think it's a binary answer. I think there's probably a little bit of blame or credit to lay on both sides of this, but I'm mostly going to praise the Bombers. And that's not because the Riders didn't have an embarrassing performance. It was. But that being said, the Riders had already won the game that truly mattered. And I'll say this, for fans who have never been to the Labor Day Classic or Banjo Bowl, I don't think they understand the extent to which home field advantage plays into those two games. Those are the most electrifying games in the CFL, bar none. It is an NFL-like atmosphere, a college rivalry game type atmosphere. And the Riders had already done what they needed to do. They got the win on Labor Day. They put some more space between themselves and the Calgary Stampeders for third place in the West Division. And I will say the team I thought got a little bit sassy, maybe a little bit fat after that win on Labor Day. You had Craig Dickinson talking about some of the cheese that the Bombers do with their blocking, trying to goad people into taking penalties. And then his team came out and got absolutely obliterated. Worse, by the way, than they did last year when half of their team was sitting on the toilet with the Nova virus moments before the game even began. So I do think the Riders deserve some blame because at the end of the day, they're not that guy. They're a solid team, but I think there were some Rider fans after the Labor Day Classic who thought their team was going to go into IG Field and win that one. I had the Bombers by a blowout. It was the blowout. And the Riders are not that guy. The Riders are a solid team with a few holes, a few areas where they need to improve. Like They're they're worthy of their 500 record, and I do think they'll make the playoffs this season. But they are not the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and they were not going to go into hostile territory and get the win. We saw what an angry Zach Kolaris is capable of doing which I think is something that will give CFL defensive coordinators nightmares. If anything, defensive coordinators around the CFL should be sending Zach Kolaris and his wife flowers before every game, trying to make sure he's not upset with them. Because what he did in that first half was perfect football. Perfect football. Let's not forget in addition to his stat line, which was really just one half of work because the Bombers called off the dogs in the third quarter and then sat him in the fourth, Kenny Lawler dropped a touchdown pass at the start of the third quarter. It could have easily been six touchdowns for Zach Kolaris in about 35 minutes of work, which is the type of production that you, you, go, you go years without seeing in a single game, certainly in the CFL, even in the NFL as well. Unbelievable performance from Winnipeg in that one. It was an absolute showcase of Winnipeg's talent across the board. And I don't think there's a single area that you can come away from that bit, that game for the Bombers and say, hey, we didn't perform up to our standard on that one. Whether it was the rushing attack, the passing attack, the defense, everything was firing on all cylinders. But I am going to take a little bit of issue with what you said there, Hodge, because you mentioned that the Riders won the game that mattered because they pulled the upset off at home in the Labor Day Classic. They all matter. This is football. Every game You're not for the prairies, dude. You're not for the prairies. I am originally from the prairies. Edmonton is not the prairies. Edmonton Edmonton is is not the prairies. It is not the prairies. Thank you very much. 
hit us up in the comments if you think Edmonton is the Prairies. But it's not the Prairies. The, every single game matters. And while I didn't necessarily expect the Riders to come in here and win this game, we know that the home field tilts the advantage to Winnipeg. I expected them to show up, and they didn't. They plain didn't, right? You mentioned it already, Hodge. Last year, they were playing with about 30 healthy guys. Everyone else was hooked up to IVs because they were exploding out of both ends. And they put up a better fight with that crew than they did this year, fully healthy with the same amount of rest as the Bombers coming off a very important win the week before. That has to be incredibly disappointing for every aspect of the Riders organization. And quite frankly, it should be a gut check for them because this is a good football team, a team that has the potential on any given game day to come out and pull off a win against a better opponent because they do have talent on that roster. But not if they show up like they did this past week against the Bombers, who... They allowed to just run through them in every single aspect. That's an unacceptable performance for a football team. And I hope Craig Dickinson is holding his team to task for that. And let me be clear. I'm not suggesting that the Banjo Bowl doesn't matter in the standings. When I say matter, I'm speaking in terms of the rivalry that exists between these two teams that is burning as hot as any rivalry in the CFL. Ryder Nation does not expect Saskatchewan to win the Banjo Bowl. Ryder Nation expects their team will win the Labor Day Classic. They had well, not maybe they should lost, expect it. They had not lost three consecutive Labor Day Classics in over 40 years, and they had lost the last two. And, of course, 2020 was no season. So this was a Ryderville that felt burned, that felt spurned by its team going two seasons, three years without a win. They got it on Labor Day, and that's why the crowd responded. To use Zach Kolaris's word, like they just won the Super Bowl. That's how he described it after the Labor Day Classic. Not even Grey Cup, the Super Bowl, which is wild. But that aside, I claim I, I at least praise the Bombers because there were whispers after this last game. You know, if Saskatchewan wins this game, they, they'd have the tiebreaker over Winnipeg. They'd be within four points of Winnipeg. Is there really a chance that Mosaic Stadium could host a playoff game this year? And the answer to that question is no. And again, I'm not disrespecting what the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are. They're a 500 football team. They got a really good D line. I like some of the young receivers who have stepped up for them. Jake Dolagala, I think, has surpassed all expectations. He's been very solid in his three starts against tough opponents, but that team does have holes in the secondary. It's got holes on the offensive line. It is an average football team right now. And between the two games, I mean, if you average them out, they look pretty average to me. That's just my take. That's, that's not how the sport works. It's individual games, and maybe they should expect to win this contest. Yeah, but you, you, should but you take it to win every game. Like let's, but you let's let's go back. Every game. Well, I don't know if you expect it. Maybe you should. But this team was looking down the barrel of a three-game streak against BC, and then a home home against Winnipeg. They went two and one. If you went back in a time machine and you asked Ryder fans or even the Riders themselves hooked up to a lie detector, would you take two and one in this three game streak? Unanimously, they would have said, yes, absolutely. We'll take two and one. This is a gauntlet. We'll take two and one all day. That's what they got. They just didn't show up for the third game. The Ottawa Red Blacks have lost six consecutive games after losing to the Hamilton Tiger Cats at home, despite the Tabbies playing on only three days of rest. Meanwhile, the Calgary Stampeders coughed up a 16-point lead to the Elks in the fourth quarter and have now lost six of their last eight games. Do either of these teams have a chance to make the playoffs? Yes, I think Calgary still has a legitimate shot. Uh, it's, they've made it much tougher on themselves than they needed to, but I still don't fully trust the Hamilton Tiger Cats as a playoff team. And I think there is the potential for a crossover into the East Division for the Stampeders. As for the Red Blacks, as far as I'm concerned, if you can't win this game this last week when your opponent is on three days of rest, which is an absolutely absurd number in just about any sport, let alone in professional football, then I'm not sure what games you can win down the stretch. There was hope when you first inserted Dustin Crum into the lineup. He hasn't 
taking the steps forward necessary to become a multifaceted player right now. The offense looks looks stagnant. The defense does not look good enough. Now they've lost Abdul Kanga for the season with a broken hand. The Red Blacks are completely on ice as far as I'm concerned, but there is still hope in Calgary. I am fully aware that the Riders lost the Banjo Bowl by 45 points. With that being said, the Ottawa Red Blacks loss this past week to the Hamilton Tiger Cats was the single worst and most humiliating loss by any team this CFL season. You are coming off a bye. You are at home in front of your fans, who at this point, honestly, are the best thing going for the Red Blacks. Our nation has continued to show up despite the abysmal and embarrassing performance of that team, not just this season, but dating back to 2019. I ran the numbers. This team now at 3-9, and nine, and I agree with your assessment, JC, not going to the playoffs for a fourth consecutive season, is 13-49, and 49, dating back to the start of 2019. 13 wins in four years. Even if they get a couple more, they're still going to have fewer wins in 2023 pardon me, over the last four seasons than the Toronto Argonauts will have in 2023. The Toronto Argonauts are currently 10-1. and one. I think they're going to win 15 games this season. I've got them at 15-3 and three right now. Winnipeg, I've got at 13-5. and five. They could finish with 14, though, I think. This team needs to just go away, honestly. Every year, they trot back a you know, a large contingent of the same core of players. And this losing streak, by the way, or this 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 run of misery for the Red Blacks, I'll call it, now spans multiple head coaches, multiple general managers, multiple coordinators, multiple starting quarterbacks, the like. This is not a one-person problem, and there's a lot of people in that organization who I really like and have a lot of respect for. But at this point in time, this is a loser franchise full of losing players who need to stop talking and get it figured out because every off season, again, they trot out the same core of guys who talk about how they love playing together and how they love Bob Dice and how they, they're going to get it figured out. And the culture here is so good. I'll tell you what, 13 and 49, your culture's not good. Your culture's not good. If your culture was good, your team would be good. You, a, a team that is happy losing together is not a team that I would want to cheer for or pay to watch on the field. This team needs to get it sorted. This team needs an overhaul because right now, from top to bottom, it is not working. Again, there's quality people in the building. There's quality people who I like and respect, but it is clearly not working. This win had to be a win for the Ottawa Red Blacks, and they found yet another way to lose. That is embarrassing. And I know there's going to be people in our comment section and and online who say, well, how can you be so harsh on the Red Blacks? I mean, they've lost their starting quarterback in back-to-back years in Jeremiah Mazzoli to devastating injuries. And yes, that is true. And frankly, you have to take that into account a little bit. But this is a league where you need at least two quarterbacks and you need to be prepared to lose your starter and you need to have the talent to compensate if that if that happens. And quite frankly, in the receiving core for the Red Blacks, they don't have that right now, right? That offense without Jeremiah Mazzoli does not look good enough. There's nobody who scares you. Initially, when Dustin Crum was, looking, was running around and he had that element in the offense, you thought, okay, maybe that's the compensating factor. But once teams started shutting that down, it's become a stagnant, boring failure of a passing attack. And you just can't win in the CFL like that. I was thrilled when they hired Bob Dice as the head coach. He's a guy I really like and respect. Sean Burke had done great work in Hamilton as the assistant GM there. I had high hopes for him turning around this roster. But as you said, Hodge, like what they've done has not worked yet. And you really have to wonder, even one year into Dice's tenure and just two years into Burke's, how long they can maintain the status quo and if either of those guys will be back next season. I've got a couple questions for you, JC. Yes, it's true. The Red Blacks are on QB3. Um, the team that came into TD Place and beat them on three days of rest, um, were they also starting a third-string quarterback? Yes, they were. Right. And the team that beat Winnipeg on Labor Day, uh, the Riders, were they also starting a third-string quarterback? 
Yes, they were. Okay, so there's lots of other teams also dealing with the same problem. And also, I take issue with people calling Dustin Crum Ottawa's third-string quarterback because their second-string quarterback to start the season was Nick Arbuckle. He's been healthy the whole time. He just was no good at all. So Ottawa, yes, Jeremiah Masoli being out is obviously unfortunate. That's been the case for a couple of years, but they knew he wasn't going to be healthy for the start of the season. They did nothing to improve their quarterback room. Nick Arbuckle has been healthy this whole time. Again, he's just not been any good. So there are a couple of excuses I think have some validity in our nation, but the quarterback one is wearing thin, especially given that Dustin Crum, I think, has been just as good as Tyree Adams was. And honestly, I mean, not he hasn't been he hasn't been a lot worse than Jeremiah Masoli was last year, though he was only healthy for whatever that was, four or five games in 2022. But it's bad. And as for Calgary, things are bad there as well, but I do still think Calgary has a chance reasonably to make the playoffs. They have four wins right now. They're one back of Hamilton. They're going to need some help, but I think that crossover could be available. We'll also see what happens with Saskatchewan, how they respond to this loss in the Banjo Bowl. Currently, they're two games ahead of Calgary. However, they have one more meeting left head-to-head. Tiebreaker yet to be decided between those two clubs. I will make one quick correction before we move on, and that's Dustin Crum wasn't actually the third string quarterback to start the year. He was the fourth string quarterback to, well, to know, start yeah, the year. Enough. We forgot about Tyree Adams. No, so I threw anyway, Tyree Adams in there. I, I, in fair, all I'm saying is people are saying, well, they've lost, you know, their two first string or their their first and second string quarterbacks. That's not true. Their second string quarterback has been healthy this whole time. It just happens that their fourth quarterback is better than their second quarterback. That's all. The CFL's schedule has adjusted to the start of the NFL regular season, moving to double haggers on Friday and Saturday nights. You wrote a column, Hodge, about the CFL's scheduling changes for the summer of 2023 and why you considered them to be a success. Tell us about it. So previously, the CFL schedule in the summertime, we would see one game on Thursday, one game on Friday, followed by a double header on Saturday. And this season... Presumably with the hopes of capturing a large television audience and those who have been kind of pre-programmed or trained by the NFL to watch football on Sundays, they elected to instead change the schedule for a Thursday through Sunday slot. Part of that was their television deal on the state side with CBS. Now, we don't have any CBS numbers as they are not a network that provides or, or are tested by Nielsen ratings. I, I'm not an expert on TS or TV ratings. That would be our resident expert, Justin Dunk, who is not here on today's show. We'll be back next week. But so far on TSN, from the numbers that have been exclusively reported by Mr. Dunk, Sundays finished ahead this summer of the audience on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. The Sunday broadcast this year have averaged an audience on English language television of 542,000. I'm rounding to the nearest thousand. That is well ahead of Thursday at 465, and also ahead by a decent margin of Fridays at 506 and Saturdays at 497. Now, the Sunday number does include the Labor Day Classic between the Riders and Bombers, which is often the most viewed game of the season. So far, it is easily the most viewed game of the 2023 season at 975,000. But even with that taken out of the equation, the viewership is still a half a million on Sunday nights, which is ahead of Thursday and Saturday. So to me, the CFL took a bit of a risk here, right? It could have easily happened like we did right with Thursday football. We, we Thursday night football was launched in 2015. It It's fine, but it, it hasn't become a brand or a, a big successful entity the way that Friday night football has for the CFL since it launched in 1997. Yet Sundays were, I thought, a very strong success for the league. And in fact, if given the choice between keeping the schedule the same or even eliminating Thursday nights altogether and going for a Friday doubleheader Saturday Sunday type configuration next next year I would imagine that a lot of fans who have been very vocal certainly in my timeline on Twitter responding to this column there's a lot of positivity around Sunday nights there were some complaints for fans who said it's tough to go to the game and then of course work the next day especially if you got to travel but from the numbers that I ran 
there was no positive or negative effect on local attendance on Sunday night games. Yes, some some fans probably stayed away because they had to work Mondays. However, I'm sure there were lots of campers and cottage goers who would have otherwise been out of town on the weekend who said, hey, if we're getting back to town by lunchtime on Sunday, why don't we go to the game? We, we may as well. So there's kind of a trade-off there. Uh, but for myself, my opinion is I thought Sundays were a rousing success for the first year in the CFL Sunday night summer broadcasts. And the numbers make that clear, Hodge, right? These are absolutely fantastic numbers. TV ratings, I believe, have been up across the board for the CFL this season. But these Sundays have been a big part of it. And it's something we've called for the league to experiment with for a long time. Kudos to them to finally doing it. And now, of course, we have to shift away because the NFL has started up and they dominate the Sunday market. But I, w- I wonder, and I don't know if the league would ever test this out, But if you could do a Sunday game, an earlier kickoff, where it's not going against Sunday night football, but it's going up against the earlier matchups, I wonder what the numbers would be for the CFL on TSN on a Sunday, even with the NFL season going on, if it was against those midday matchups. I don't think we'll ever get to see it because the the league has made it, you know, the policy until the playoffs to stay entirely away from days when the NFL is scheduled. But I would like. I'd be interested to know those numbers because I do think they'd be better than most people expect. Uh, Certainly Sunday night football is an entity in and of itself. I think it drew over 700,000 this week, but that's not dissimilar from the numbers that those key rivalry rematches got on Saturday. So that's something to consider for the future in my mind, at least. Well, something the CFL did change for this season, in addition to the summer scheduling is come playoff time, they're not going to compete with the NFL this year. The playoff games have been moved from Sundays to Saturdays. The only Sunday playoff game is the Grey Cup this year, which remains set for Sunday, November 19th, at Tim Hortons Field in Hamilton. Do you really want to see the CFL compete with the early Sunday games? Are you crazy? I would. I, no, I, I don't know if it would last, right? I don't want to do it all off the bat and say, okay, I'm putting all my eggs in this basket, but I would like to see the experiment done. That take we don't is know, insane right? to me. That take is actually certifiably insane to me. In in the past, CFL playoff games, right, going up against Sunday NFL games have done good numbers, right? Playoff They've done games. great numbers. Yes, but against a regular – like. Viewers are going all over the place for the midday Sunday NFL games, right? They're they're getting drugged to different games. Not not everyone's invested like they are with Sunday night football and I tuning completely in to one disagree with that. Victory. I completely disagree. Sunday night, if it's a dud in the NFL, you're gonna get people going over to the CFL, right? The early games, you're guaranteed. First of all, a bunch of people's actual teams are playing, right? Because you got like like eight or ten games to match up with. So CFL fans, or I should say Canadian football fans, right? There's a a much better chance that the team they actually cheer for is playing in the early Sunday slot. And then it doesn't matter if the game they start with ends up being terrible. They either just watch Red Zone or they go to over to a good game. To me, where the CFL might, if any, be able to make some hay is the late Sunday slot because the game could be a dud and people are end up turning over to the CFL. To me, the early slot is the one to avoid like the plague. That's 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 a fair point. I would just like to see the experiment. I mean, again, I don't think it's ever going to happen because there are many logical reasons why you would want to avoid that day entirely. But it would be interesting to see the side by side comparison because there was a time when people said, you know, Sundays just wouldn't work in the summer, right? And we've clearly seen that that is not the case. That like it's been incredibly successful. Forever and ever, we've been told that we can't compete going directly directly against the NFL. I don't know if it's as true as people make it out to be. Well, last year in the East semifinal, Hamilton and Montreal, that was the early Sunday slot. The rating was five hundred and sixteen thousand, which is which was a little more than the season long average on CFL. But that's a pretty paltry number for a playoff game. The East final also did relatively poorly with 629, which again, that's less than, than they got for Banjo Ball this week. So I that's think the that East. 
Yes, but that's the early Sunday slot that you think is apparently up for grabs because there's only, what, 800 NFL games going on? There's exactly one good team in the East Division at any one time. I don't think the East Division playoff games are a great indication. I'll, I'll say this. If you were to put Winnipeg, Saskatchewan against the early Sunday slot, they'd probably draw fine. But they would not draw as well as they would anywhere else. To me, the early Sunday slot is a disaster, which is why the CFL has gone away from that, even in its playoff games. And I think we're going to see a big bounce in the playoff performance in terms of ratings this year, especially out east where they're not competing against NFL Red Zone and the litany of games that are ongoing at the same time where everyone's trying to see how their fantasy players are doing and they're checking in on what the hot matchups are because that is the advantage the NFL has, especially on that early Sunday slot, is they've got 10 games to choose from. At least one of them is going to be really good versus the primetime games, especially the Thursday nights, which, which have traditionally been terrible. If you get a dud, everyone's stuck with the dud. By the way, the CFL ha- also has that issue where when a game is amazing, the, the positive is everybody's focused on it because it's the only game happening at, at, at that particular time. When the game is a dud, you've, you've got that opposite problem where everyone's sitting and watching a dud. Chad Kelly's run of success with the Toronto Argonauts has drawn comparisons to the great Doug Flutie. Given that the team is 10-1 and one, with a chance to punch their ticket to the East Final with a win over Montreal this week. Does Kelly remind you of Flutie this season? No. And that's no re- disrespect to Chad Kelly, who has been absolutely superb, spectacular in his first ye- season as starter. And is a legitimate candidate to win most outstanding player. And clearly... The way you can compare these two is their leadership ability and the fact that they've driven a talented roster to a fantastic 10 and one start. And we should note that the one game that the Toronto Argonauts have lost is the game that Chad Kelly exited early with an ankle injury. And they had Cameron Dukes in at quarterback for the majority of that loss. So you can't even pin that one on Chad. But as for a comparison with Flugi, I mean, the numbers don't just stack up, right? The statistics that Flugi put up in his time as an Argonaut, in his time anywhere in the CFL, were at another level entirely compared to the very good ones that Kelly is putting up right now. And they have two entirely different playing styles. We've got a guy who is big and strong and powerful versus, you know, one of these dynamic, smaller quarterbacks who can run around and create plays in that capacity. The comparison between the two starts and ends at their ability to lead talented rosters. You cannot compare the two based on playing style or, uh, or, or their production right now. Yeah, I am happy to agree with you. And unlike your NFL take and your MOP pick this season, you are actually speaking the truth here, Mr. Abbott. I could not agree more with this take. Credit to Chad Kelly for all that he's done this season. The Argos are the number one team in the CFL. They're certainly number one in our rankings. They've been fantastic this season. They've yet to lose a game when he starts And finishes. And to that end, I can see some comparisons to Flutie making sense, just looking at the team's record. But this team has overall, I think, the most talent of any team in the CFL. They still don't have that number one receiver who really terrifies you, but they've got an amazing cast of kind of secondary options. Their best has probably been DeVaris Daniels this year, who might actually go over a thousand yards for the first time in his career. But the run game is sensational. The offensive line is great. And that defense, I think, is super underrated, led by Corey Mace, arguably the best defensive coordinator in the CFL. The secondary is super deep. The the defensive line, I think, is super deep. And then you've got Winton McManus in that linebacking core alongside Adarius Pickett alongside some very talented players. To me, they have the most talent and probably the most depth of any team in the CFL. That is why they are being successful. Chad Kelly certainly takes part of that success. Doug Flutie was on another level. Chad Kelly, by the way, on pace for 29 touchdown passes this year. Doug Flutie, over the course of his career, even including his rookie season, in which he only threw for 16 with the BC Lions, averaged 34 
Kelly on pace for 275 rushing yards this season. Doug Flutie, over his eight years in the CFL, averaged 583, over double what Chad Kelly was doing. To me, if Chad Kelly was doing the same through the air, but running like Trey Ford, I think this comp makes a lot of sense. As it stands, to me, it doesn't. This is just people going, hey, these two teams are both really good. Therefore, their quarterbacks must be the same. Kelly is not the MLP, in my view. Um, I would still give Zach Kolaris that nod, though it should be stated he does have two games in hand on Kolaris. The Argos have still only played 11 games so far this season, though given that they can clinch the East Division already halfway through September, I also question how much Kelly will or should be playing down the stretch. So I think that this comparison makes little to no sense, though I still give Kelly and the Argos full credit for a great season. He should not be drawing comparisons to the greatest CFL player of all time, at least certainly not right now based on what he's done. Yeah, we all know my take on MOP and how I believe that Werner Adams Jr. should be a serious contender in the conversation. But Chad Kelly, the biggest thing stacked against him right now is the fact that his team is not going to have any meaningful games for basically the rest of the season after this week if they can win and clinch the East. So he's not going to put up MOP level numbers the rest of the way, in my opinion. They're going to pull him back a little bit. He probably will sit out the last week, if not the last couple weeks of the season, right? Or at least take breaks. They're not going to have to press the ball down the field and do those things that other teams might like Winnipeg and BC when they're going to be dueling out for p- first place in the West when they go head to head in week 18, right? So his numbers are not going to be near the same level. I think his impact is undeniably MOP level right now. But he may end up losing this race by default just because of how deep the rest of his team is. At the game you'll be at this weekend, Hodge, the Montreal Alouettes are six and a half point home underdogs to the visiting Toronto Argonauts. These teams met at BMO Field last week where the Argos ran rough shot over the Owls, winning 39 to 10 to punch their ticket to the playoffs. If Toronto can get another win this weekend, they will officially clinch first place in the East Division and host the East Final for a third straight year. Who you have straight up? And against the spread. I'm going to say the same thing about the Montreal Alouettes here that I did earlier about the Riders, which is they're not that guy, right? This is a this is a 500 team with a few really big bright spots, a few holes on the roster, you know, some really good coaching in some respects, coaching that's maybe been lacking in other respects. I do not see this being a particularly close game. I could see the Argos taking their foot off the gas partway through the game, as we've seen them do at times this year after building a lead, but I still have them winning and winning relatively big in La Belle Provence. I will take the Argos to win and cover this spread. I would consider taking uh, Montreal against the spread if it went up to about eight points. Right now, it's six and a half. I'm very happy to roll with the Toronto Argonauts. I was incredibly confident with my pick last week that the Argos were going to cover their big 10 and a half point spread against Montreal. And of course they did, right? That was a dominant blow win that showed just how big the chasm is between these two teams in the East Division playoff race. But in this situation, it's hard to beat teams back to back. And it's even harder to blow out teams on back to back weeks. I think there's a backdoor cover here for the Alouettes at home, even at six and a half points. So I'll pick them to cover, but the Argonauts are the better team and they'll win again this week. The Rough Riders are three-point home favorites against the visiting Elks on Friday. Saskatchewan is coming off a humiliating 45-point loss to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to the Banjo Bowl, while suddenly the red-hot Edmonton Elks have won three of their last four. The Riders won both previous meetings between these two clubs, with both wins coming in tight games. Which shade of green are you backing in this one? 
I'm backing the lighter one because the Saskatchewan Rough Raggers need to make a statement after that loss last week. They can't afford to come out flat once again. They need to prove to everyone in the league that they are not the team that got blown out last week. And for the Edmonton Elks, while Trey Ford has looked good, he has struggled as a passer the last two weeks. And coming into Mosaic Stadium, that is a tough, tough place to play for a young quarterback. I'm backing the Riders to win and cover. Anthony Lanier did not practice for Saskatchewan on Tuesday. There does seem to be concern, some concern that he will not play, though the Riders will get Pete Robertson back from suspension. I'm also going to take the Riders to win and cover full credit to the Edmonton Elks for what they've been able to do the last little bit. You also know that Chris Jones would love to go into Regina and get a win, but I do think as much as this game will be close, I think the Riders have more to play for. They still have hopes and dreams of playing a home playoff game. I will take the Riders not by a touchdown, but I would be willing to go up to four points for Saskatchewan in this one. The Blue Bombers visit the Tiger Cats on Saturday with the Tiger Cats six and a half point home underdogs. Hamilton got a surprise win last week when they edged out the Ottawa Red Blacks despite visiting the nation's capital on only three days rest. These teams met way back in the first week of the regular season with Winnipeg coming out with a decisive victory. Who you got? I'm interested to see who's going to start a quarterback here for the Tie Cats because Taylor Powell, as much as he's played pretty decently as of late, Matthew Schultz got back onto the active roster last week in a third string role. I'm not actually sure that he even dressed, but that is at least an indication that he is going to be back soon. And I think that him getting into that offense with Omar Bayless, the young receiver, stepping in for Duke Williams, and I think looking pretty good, doing some promising things. Tim White having a massive game. We should give Tim White his flowers for that stellar performance against the Red Blacks. I think that could change things. That being said, the Bombers had a miserable performance last year at Tim Hortons Field. They lost this game by a considerable amount. I forget the final score, but I do remember that Dane Evans had five touchdown passes for the Tide Cats. I don't think the Bombers will make that same mistake. I'm skeptical the Bombers can beat Toronto two weeks from now. I do think the Bombers will do enough to win and cover in Steeltown this week. Though again, that pick, I would say, is assuming Taylor Powell plays. If Matthew Schiltz plays, I might want to reassess that. Jeez, what are we even talking about here, Hodge? Come on. Like, Taylor Powell has been a solid quarterback for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and I have complete faith in him. But this is the Bombers we're talking about, and I don't think they're going to let off the gas entirely after that blowout, and there's going to be an emotional letdown for the Hamilton Tiger Cats who, you know, did everything they could to pull out the unlikely victory on very little rest last week. Now that they've had a full week to recover, I don't think they're going to come out as fired up. I think this is a trap for them, and the Bombers are going to be smooth sailing in Steeltown. The Red Blacks visit the Lions on Saturday night with the home side favored by nine and a half points. Ottawa has lost six games in a row while BC is coming off a bye week. Do you have any faith that the Red Blacks can cover this wide spread or will the Lions be too much to handle? I think the Lions are just too much to handle. This team is going to be well-rested. They have one of the most explosive offenses in the league when they're firing on all cylinders, and the Red Blacks in all phases just are not where they need to be right now. Dustin Crum is going to be eaten alive by Ryan Phillips' defense. This is going to be a big win for BC at home. I completely concur with you, JC. As stated earlier in the show, I'm more or less done with Ottawa this season. They need to go back to the drawing board and get things figured out. BC is not going to make a mistake in this game. They were on a bye. They're going to come out prepared. They're going to come out ready to go. And I think that the BC Lions will more than cover the spread. I don't think this game is going to be particularly close. It's now time for Hodges Heritage Moment. On this day in 2014, the BC Lions defeated the Winnipeg Blue Bombers by a score of 26 to 9, marking the club's fourth consecutive game without a turnover. 
Though the streak would end the following week, it remains a CFL record for the longest number of games played without turning the football over. JC, do you remember this stretch of time? I do, but I don't remember the record being set. It's not something that's, you know, embedded in my memory of those days when I was a Lions season ticket holder. But it's remarkable that the streak for, you know, consecutive games without a turnover is only four games. I know that's incredibly difficult to pull off, but I would have still expected it to be longer than that. You know, someone's got to have a conservative offense, you know, that doesn't you know, throw a bunch of balls up for interceptions or, or give it up via fumbles. That surprises me. I would be interested to know what the record is if you don't include what often happens in games where a losing team will, you know, they, they won't have any fumbles or interceptions, but at the end of the game down a score, they'll have to gamble on a third down and they won't convert it. And that to me, I think, as much as, don't get me wrong, takeaways obviously still matter a tremendous amount of football, I do think it skews the statistic, right? People always say, well, to win games, you have to run the ball and protect the ball. And it's like, okay, but teams run the ball more when they're winning, which slants that statistic one way. And then also teams playing desperately to try to tie a game late or win a game late will inevitably turn the ball over because they're playing more aggressively or they have no choice but to gamble late on third down. So I'd, I'd be curious to know what that statistic is with that caveat. One thing I will point out, the BC Lions went three and one in these games. One of those victories came in Ottawa. Please remember this was the Red Blacks expansion season during which the team only won three games. Wait, maybe not that much has changed. Um, actually, sorry, I think it was two games for Ottawa in 2014, two games. But the win BC had in the nation's capital was to this day the worst game I have ever witnessed at any level of football. The final score was 7-5. And I remember finishing that game thinking I could have got the same entertainment value watching any high school, peewee, Terminator game in the province of Manitoba. That was an atrocious display of CFL football. Whatever the best CFL game is, I... A lot of people say it's the 1989 Grey Cup. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. 2016 Grey Cup would probably be right up there. It doesn't matter. I know what the worst game is. It was that particular game between BC and Ottawa. Absolutely miserable. That one I do remember vividly. I believe uh, Travis Lule, that was his doesn't have a shoulder era when he That's was going correct. out there. and Just an absolute noodle. Yeah, that was that was a very tough, tough game to watch and sit through. And if you like today's podcast, please tweet at JC Abbott with the hashtag Absolute Noodle. That's hashtag <laughs> Absolute Noodle. It's now time for the three-minute drill. John Cornish and Brian Chu are both being inducted into the BC Football Hall of Fame this year. Are they worthy selections? Of course they are. If you are going to make a Mount Rushmore of the best football players to ever come out of this province – both of these players arguably should be on it. John Cornish, of course, one of the greatest running backs ever, arguably the greatest Canadian running back ever. Brian Chu, how he's not in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame yet, I'll never know. Now, of course, he is the head coach at Vancouver College, which is the reigning BC Provincial High School football champions at both the varsity and junior varsity level. So he is still getting it done out here with his old alma mater. Taylor L. Gurzma threw for six touchdowns in Wilfrid Laurier University's 60-21 to 21 decimation of Justin Dunk's University of Guelph <laughs> this past week. Does he have what it takes to play in the CFL someday? Well, he's not super mobile, but he's six foot six, weighs 220 pounds, and is still only in his third year with the Golden Hawks. To me, Taylor Eldersma is one to keep an eye on. The CFL and CFLPA have agreed to turn over their air quality testing to a third party, ending a dispute between the two sides. Is that a smart idea? I think it is. It gives some legitimacy to the air quality uh, agreement between these two sides. I was surprised that the CFLPA pressed the issue after the Labor Day Classic game between Calgary and Edmonton. I don't know how much appetite there really is from the players to actually cancel a game because of smoke issues, but now if they want to, they actually have the power to press the issue. 
the Saskatchewan Rough Riders announced the first five players they're bringing back for their upcoming 2013 Grey Cup celebration, including running back Corey Sheets. Do you remember how dominant he was for the Riders that year? There are very few players in CFL history who have been as dominant as Corey Sheets was in that year. His candle did not burn brightly for long, but it did burn remarkably brightly when it was lit for a two-year period. He was virtually untackleable, Corey Sheets, in those two years, as good as probably any player has been in this league. In a story our colleague Justin Dunk broke, presumably after finishing crying after Guelph's loss. The Alouettes signed linebacker Darnell Sankey. Can he help elevate Montreal's defense? I think he absolutely can. The defense has struggled because of some serious injuries to key components over the last little bit. Avery Williams has missed a lot of time at middle linebacker, as has Tyrell Richards, who was their first overall pick two years ago now. Darnell Sankey, not a great guy to have in space, but between the tackles in the box, one of the truly elite tacklers that this league has seen in recent years, he's going to help that team, especially when it comes to stopping the run. Orlando Steinhauer addressed a cryptic tweet from Duke Williams, which made it appear as though he was leaving Hamilton. The receiver has since been added to the six-game injured list with an ankle injury. Hodge, what is going on with Duke? Well, my sources indicate that Duke was told that he was being shut down for the year as a result of this angle injury, and he was not happy about it. I don't expect him to suit up again for the Ticats this year, and I don't expect he'll play another game for the Ticats. That is, at least according to my sources, take that for what you will. British kicker Dean Faithful went viral after kicking a game-winning field goal for the Elks and celebrating by waving his hand like the Queen. Did you like his celebration? I love the celebration. I've been incredibly critical of Dean Faithful. I think he's a misuse of the league's global program. And frankly, despite some of the success he's had, I still think he's the worst kicker in the league. But this is a memory that should be embedded in his mind, his teammates' minds, and everyone's mind for the foreseeable future. One of the great CFL moments, him being carried off the field, waving like the queen, and his Nan's lucky horseshoe with him on the side sidelines. That is a truly fantastic CFL moment. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers hosted quarterback Chris Strevler for an autograph signing ahead of the Banjo Bowl. Hodge, how beloved is Strevler in the Manitoba capital? Streveler is one of the most popular human beings that I have ever encountered in this province. We are having a provincial election next month. If Chris Streveler ran, I don't think it would matter which party he would come out with a landslide victory. The lineup to get autographs from Chris Streveler was a mile long. He was honored at halftime. People went ballistic. He is as loved as any player in Winnipeg. Honestly, I would put him right up there with guys like Chris Walby, Milt Stiegel. The reaction was wild. The University of British Columbia Thunderbirds are now eighth on the U Sports football rankings after starting the season with a perfect 2-0 record. Do you think the T-Birds should be even higher? We really do. Right from the start of this season, I've had them ranked at number four in my rankings. I have them as the best team in the Canada West. Really, that was because of the uncertainty surrounding the Saskatchewan Huskies having a new quarterback under center for that school. Anton Amandrag has looked fantastic thus far this season, but until they win a head-to-head, right now I think Garrett Rooker and the T-Birds are the team to beat in the Canada West, and they deserve to be the best team in that conference in the top 10. On a somber note, CFL and NFL agent Cameron Weiss passed away from cancer this week at the age of 38. He represented the likes of Vernon Adams Jr. and Nathan Rourke. What do you make of his passing, Hodge? Well, it's obviously devastating for all those who knew Cam. Um, He was a great resource for CFL media people, at least when he could be 
across the league. Other players he represented, at least in part, McLeod Bethel-Thompson, Markeith Amble, Stephen Dunbar Jr., Nick Usher, Cameron Judge, Luchez Purifoy, Trey Roberson, Jovan Santos-Knox. There was an outpouring on social media from players like Rourke, like Adams, about him. And there was even a note from Winnipeg Blue Bombers assistant general manager Ted Gavaya, who wrote, Cameron was a good, as good as they come, a fierce competitor, a crafty negotiator, a master of his craft. Oftentimes, people negotiating contracts hate agents, or at least if not hate, there is animosity, given that they are, of course, fiercely negotiating against one another. I thought that that tip of the cap from Gavaya spoke volumes about Mr. Weiss. Rest in peace. Best to his family and friends at this tough time. Zach Kolaris was given a 94 grade by Pro Football Focus for his five touchdown performance in the Banjo Bowl, the highest single grade of any player so far this season. Was that deserved? Of course it was. We've already discussed this game. It was a near perfect performance from Kolaris and the rest of the Bombers. Of course it deserves a near perfect grade as well. The Montreal Alouettes put Greg Ellingson right back on the six-game injured list just one week after the receiver made his season debut with the team. Has he been the most disappointing free agent signing from this past winger? That is a great question. To me, I would say the most disappointing would probably be Jagera Davis in Hamilton, who I think a lot of people were hoping would turn back the clock to 2021, just wasn't able to do it. But that being said, it is disappointing that Ellington has not played more. I will say there's a changing of the guard that seems to be happening at receiver in the CFL right now. Guys like Greg Ellingson, guys like Shaq Evans, uh, Duke Williams, you could even throw into that mix, clearly just don't look like the players they used to be. With some young guys like Sean Bain, Tevin Jones, Sam Amelis, obviously Dalton Schoen still doing his thing. Stepping up and filling that void. Alexander Hollins. I'll also throw him into the mix. Another player who's on the down low, by the way, right now, Lucky Whitehead. I'll throw him into a category of guys who I'm not going to say are washed up, but don't appear to be the players that they once were. Last one, JC, the New York Jets suffered a huge loss on Monday Night Football when Aaron Rodgers suffered a torn Achilles early in the first quarter. Should they claim Nathan Rourke from Jacksonville's practice roster? Absolutely should. He's a player that could help this team right now. Now, of course, Zach Wilson, their former first round draft pick, is still on that roster. But Wilson was so bad last year at times. They were having Chris Strevler, another former CFL quarterback, take snaps in games on the scale of talented CFL passers. Chris Strevler and Nathan Rourke, they're not even on the same chart. Rourke is much, much higher. He's a guy who could come in and really surprise some people. They'd be smart to make that move. Justin Dunk wrote a column off this. I, By the way, I do think that the Jets would be wise to pick up Nathan Rourke. I would almost consider it like a Brock Purdy, Trey Lance type situation where they picked a guy super high who obviously was not worth that selection, and they could – pick up off the scrap heap, a guy who maybe could be a potential franchise guy. I'm not saying Nathan Rourke is on the same level as Brock Purdy, but I do think that there is at least a possibility of Nathan Rourke being that. I don't think there's a possibility of Zach Wilson becoming that at this point. And for those who think that we're just writing fluff and just paying lip service to Nathan Rourke, June Jones, former CFL head coach who turned around the Hamilton Tiger Cats, Quote tweeted our article comparing Nathan Rourke to Joe Montana, writing, quote, I have watched every college throw, every CFL throw, all NFL preseason throws, and he agrees that the Jets should pick up Nathan Rourke from the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, I'm not going to compare Nathan Rourke to Joe Montana. I think that might be a little bit too far, but I do think that he could be a low risk, potentially high reward option for them at this point, because obviously they were counting on Aaron Rodgers being that guy for them. On that note, we thank you as always for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast. We will be back next Wednesday for another episode.